Um, my name is Joe Conway. I work for a company uh, called Crunchy Data. We specialize in Postgres and enterprises and with a particular focus on secure environments. So I'm here to talk about MLS Postgres. At a, the, what I'm going to do is start out at a kind of 50,000 foot level and hopefully help you understand what MLS is really all about and then dive down into a little bit more detail about the specific components and how the system needs to be set up. And then I'll go through some results, what it actually looks like in practice. <clears throat> so in terms of what is MLS, unfortunately that text may be, can you see that? Can you see that text in the back of the room? Okay. So multi-level security, um, and, and in particular what I'm talking about here is multi-level security as implemented by SE Linux. Um, there's a notion of sensitivities, which are kind of levels of access. And they're labeled generically as S0 through S15. And you can actually just define them for yourself to decide what that should mean to you. Uh, in, a, in a military type context, this might be S0 is unclassified, S4 might be classified, S5 might be secret, S6 might be top secret, something like that. In another context, you could label it whatever you want. The, the notion is just from high to low. In addition to the sensitivities, you also get these categories, which you don't have to use, but you can use. And the idea of the categories is they further compartmentalize access. So this is how you would implement the notion of need to know. So if I've got a certain, certain level here at S5, but I don't have this compartment C2, this category C2, then that means there's something, some information in that particular project that I don't have a need to know even though I have the right level. <clears throat> so what would this maybe look like for a non-military use? If you think of these as access groups, and in, in this case I've got management, employees, and external. And now if you go and expand that, these become projects, individual projects at a company. So if I look at just that one square right there, this is both external and it's not associated with a, a specific project. So that would be something that would be truly public. That's information that you want to share with anyone. Whereas over here, I've got external access, but it's associated with a specific proje project. And so that might be information that you want to share with a customer or a partner. Now up into this cell here, I've got employee access for a specific project. So that might be the scrum team that's working on that project. And then finally, at this level, the management level in that project, that might be the, the product owner. So just the highest level. Maybe that's financial information about the project that's not shared with everyone, something along those lines. From a practical use, the way this looks is you might have a client that has access to all three levels, and you've got Postgres running with access to all three levels, data at all three levels. You have to, in some way, shape, or form, decide what level you want to connect at, and then use an appropriate network connection to make that. Because you want the data that's going over the wire to be constrained to the level that you're network is supporting. So that can be done in a couple of ways, um, the, at least a couple of ways that we've done. One of them, as I've written here, is IPsec. You can actually tell IPsec that you want to connect with a certain SE Linux range. And the packets all get labeled with that range. And so when the connection is made, that security level gets carried over through IPsec. The other way you can do it is you could have just multiple interfaces on your Postgres server, and you can set up something called NetLabel. NetLabel will take it an unconfined, meaning a connection that doesn't have otherwise SE Linux labels on it, and based on the interface that you've connected to, it'll label it for you. 
So you can decide that if you want to constrain a particular subnet, you know, 192, you know, 192.168.4.x is always going to be my lowest level network, and 5.x might be my classified level, and 6.x might be my secret level. So I confine the packets on the network to a particular level. But IPsec is a much more flexible way to do that. And then finally, once you make the actual connection from the client using PSQL or something else to Postgres, now the context within Postgres is going to be restricted to that same level. So I know this might not all make complete sense to you right now, but I'm hoping that the pictures combined with what I'm going to go through next, will, it'll start to come together for you. Now, why not, you know, what's the business case for this? Um, certainly in a government or a military kind of context, there is, um, they will literally have multiple sets of hardware sitting on the desk. So if you want to access data at a certain level, you have to sit down at this system. And if you want to access it at another level, you have to sit down at this system. So there's a, a great deal of desire to be able to do this sort of thing in the database in order to eliminate redundant hardware. Redundant hardware on the, the client, redundant hardware on the server side. But even if you're just separating out your data for this security-wise for your business, there's still a lot of problems in terms of redundancy, in terms of duplicating of data that you want shared everywhere, in terms of being able to do reporting across all of the levels in a secure way. And in addition, um, and again, I'll get to this in a few slides, but the difference between what we're doing here and kind of normal database security is that this is something called mandatory access control. It's controlled by the system and by policies on the system and not by the person who's creating the object or creating the data, which is a little different than in a normal database system where you have discretionary access control. Basically, whoever creates the table decides who can see the table, for instance. And you could do this filtering through your application, but this way the database is, is providing the integrity for you, which is what we like to use databases for. And this whole system relies on something called RLS, which is nice. It's fairly transparent, and, it, and it, with some testing, I've, I'll show you later that uh, it performs really well. Any questions about all that before I move forward? Okay, so now talk about the, the major components of the solution. First one is row level security. It's a brand new feature in 9.5 that just came out. Uh, it's enabled on a per table basis, so you don't have to have every table using RLS. You can choose which tables you want. Uh, it's enforced with a policy. So on tables that have RLS, you're going to define a policy what are more policies. And in those policies, you're going to use what's called a using expression or a with check expression. And basically, the way that breaks down is the using expression is looking at the old row and deciding whether or not you get to see it. It's a filter. And the with check expression is looking at the new row and deciding whether or not you can actually commit that new row. And if you can't, it'll throw an error. So in terms of, this is an example of row level security. It's not MLS specific, but I wanted to start you off with something that was just pure RLS so you could understand how it works. So anyway, how many people in the room have played with RLS at all? A few, okay. So in this case, I'm, I'm creating a user called Bob, a user called Alice. Uh, I create this table that's got um, three fields in it. The, Importantly, the third one is called app user. I'm going to insert some, some dummy data into the, into the table. With the first row in the app user column, I'm, I'm labeling it Bob. And in the second row, I'm labeling it Alice. And then I'm going to alter the table to enable row level security. And I'm going to create a policy that says using app user equals current user. 
And now I have to grant select on that table to public. So now when I go to use this table, if I'm still super user, I'm actually going to see both rows because RLS doesn't apply to super user. But when I set myself up, basically log in as Bob, you notice Bob only sees Bob's row. And if you log in as Alice, Alice only sees Alice's row. So that's, in a nutshell, what RLS will do for you. Fairly simplified. We'll see more examples later of this uh, in terms of MLS, how it works with MLS. Any questions on that? RLS is row specific. The MLS solution that we have here actually can be done by column. Uh, what we've not implemented is what's known as cell level, which would be where you'd have a different, you know, potentially in the same column, different levels in each row. So you can either label it by column or you can label it by row. But in the context of a database, it, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense to try and do cell level, but that has been something that's been discussed. For an RLS enabled table, does the app user always have to be there? I mean, it sounds like it would have to, right? If you wanted to do your filtering using app user, then, then that column would need to be there. It could be any but and I'll show you the way we're doing MLS is with a, what we're calling a security label column. So we're going to use the same functionality in a very similar way to implement MLS at a row level. And, and the reason that it works that way was kind of a design decision when RLS was first put into Postgres. There were discussions about how to best do RLS, and the decision was that doing it this way is the most flexible way and therefore can handle the most use cases. So there are some, some downsides to that in that this column is visible to basically to look at, uh, and so it may not feel as, as good as maybe something that was hidden, but there are ways that you can deal with that too. I was just thinking about where your access to the database is primarily through um, functions as opposed to ad hoc through an app, um, where you may not have access to the user, like, you know, so that wouldn't really be useful to you. Well, yeah, and th for that speci this specific, right. Okay. right. If you want to be able to filter your rows based on who's logged in right now, then you need a, something in the row that can be compared to the current logged in user in order to do the filtering. It can be any expression that returns Boolean, true, false. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about SE Linux. How many people here are familiar with SE Linux? A good number, that's good. How many people here would say that they really, truly understand SE Linux? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not sure I would. I guess it depends on where you, where you draw that bar, but. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, SE Linux is a mandatory access control system, which in contrast to a discretionary access control. Discretionary access control is like you create a file on the system and you can change the permissions of that file such that anyone can read it if you decide to do that. Or if you create a table, if you're allowed to create a table in Postgres, you can grant access to that table to whoever you want. That's discretionary access control. Mandatory access control means that the system itself has policies in place that are enforcing certain rules. So it's not up to the user to decide who gets to access the data. That's kind of the, the key difference. It's enforced in the kernel, SE Linux is, and it's managed via these policies. And when you install Red Hat 7 these days, it comes with SE Linux by default on in what's called targeted policy, targeted mode. Targeted is sort of a stripped down version of SE Linux where only certain things are controlled and everything else is still wide open. And I think they did that because 
SC Linux is hard to get right, and in order to get people to actually use it, this was the best way. It also comes with this MLS policy, which is what we're going to use here. MLS policy is what is going to enable us to do this level and, and category filtering. And in our case, we also had to do some customized policy modules. Now, one thing I'll, I'll point out to you on the slides here, and the slides will be available later. Um, I put a link on the slide. See if I've got a connection. Maybe I don't. No, uh, I didn't set it. Oh, yeah, it did. It's just slow. So <laughs> there's a guy at Red Hat um, who is kind of like the SC Linux guru, and, and he produced this SC Linux coloring book to kind of explain SC Linux in the most basic terms. And, and I, it's actually pretty useful if you go through it. Um, it will help you understand how SC Linux works and what it does. So I, I would encourage you to go look at that. MLS itself is based on something called a Bell Lepadula module. And you know, there's like research papers written on this stuff. So I can't, I'm not going to try and go into the details. But if you boil it all down, what it really comes down to is you should be able to read at your level and below. And you should be able to write at your level and up. But because there's some kind of strange things you can get into with write up, SC Linux, at, or Red Hat at some point at least, decided that they were going to modify this model slightly and basically say that whatever you write is going to be equal to the level that you're logged in at. So if you're logged into SC Linux at level S6, then data that you create by default is going to be at level S6. But if you want to read something that's labeled S0, you'll, you'll be able to read it. Everything about how things are enforced in SE Linux comes down to these security contexts. So this is what a security context actually looks like. It's got a role component, or a user component, a role component, a d domain component, and then the sensitivity and category that we've already been talking about. And you can think of these two things as, as the level, the security level. And these three things combined um, are more along the lines of uh, a role-based access control. They define things that you can and can't do in the system. So some examples of what that might look like, you'd have a, a DB user, a DB client R, DB client T, and level S0. That's something we'll see later on in the examples. And you might have an object on the system, like a, a row in a table, or a table itself, that's labeled like this, system U, object R, SCPG SQL table T. And then you can see this, this defines a range of sensitivities. And this defines a range of categories. So basically, this here is saying that this table would be able to contain data at any level. In terms of these levels, you know, S0 through S15, it's a range. Uh, you can alias these things, so you can say that S0 equals green, and S4 equals yellow, and S5 equals orange, if that's what you want to call them. Um, and hierarchical dominance is defined. This is what I'm saying before about if you're logged in with an S6 level, you should be able to look at data that's at S0. So the level that you're at dominates the object. But these categories, uh, which are also, you know, this represents a group. It's, instead of a dash, it's a dot. Um, you can also alias those things. But these things are not hierarchical. Just because I have C1023, it doesn't mean I can see stuff that's labeled with C1. I have to actually have C1 to, to view C1. In SC Linux, Security access decision. This is when the kernel is going to decide, does a particular subject context, so in, the, in our case, it's going to be the Postgres user, and with a, a particular object or target context, and so in this case, we're talking about a table row, or maybe, maybe a table, maybe a column, but for the most part, for this 
presentation, we're talking about table rows. And there's some kind of a permission, something I'm trying to do to that object. So I'm trying to select it, I'm trying to delete it, I'm trying to update it, whatever. It combines those three things to decide whether or not that subject with that object and that action is allowed to occur. So type enforcement will say, are you allowed to, this is where the, uh, that user role and domain come in. Is this subject even allowed to do this type of access to this type of object? That's the first decision that's gotta be made. If you're not even allowed to select from, a, from this table based on a role-based access control, you'll be blocked right there. Assuming you pass that, then for where MLS is, is concerned, then we'll come into looking at the sensitivity in the category. So if I've got S5, then I should be able to see something that's labeled as S3. But if I've got S5, C1 to C5, that does not include S3, C42. So in that case, I would not get to see that. So the third component of this solution is um, something called SEPG SQL. It's a, an extension in Contrib in Postgres. It's been there, I think, since Postgres 9.1. Um, and the basic idea here is that Postgres was modified at the time that SEPG SQL was developed to support something called security label command. So it's a way that I can specifically say that this object in the database has some label. And as far as Postgres is concerned, that's really about all there is to it. Postgres doesn't do anything with that label by itself. It's just providing a place to store it. It depends on a label provider that actually uses the label. And SEPG SQL is the label provider. So in this case, we're going to use that label to label the object with an SC Linux object context and use SE Linux to make these decisions about access. Now, what's there in stock Postgres wasn't quite suitable for our needs, so we had to modify it. Um, at this point in time, these modifications are still not open source, but our full intent is to either push this stuff back into the community SEPG SQL, um, maybe in 9.7, whatever the community wants to accept out of it, and to the extent that some of it doesn't get accepted, we will open source our own version of SEPG SQL on GitHub or something like that. But what we've done is we've taken care of a mapping of the database user to an SE Linux user. So that when I log in to the database as Joe, I can say that Joe actually maps to some SE Linux user on the system. We're also taking care of this uh, context transition based on the user and the network. So that means that based on who the user is mapped to, and I'll show you an example of this in a few slides, and based on the network that the user logged in on, as I talked about earlier, I'm gonna decide what the label, what the context of that current connection is gonna be. And then the two main functions that we've added are this check row label and create row label. And so these are going to be used in these RLS policies to, to create a label for a row that we're inserting or changing and to verify or filter what rows we can see based on who we are. In terms of security label support, Postgres right out of the box supports labeling of all these objects. And as I just said, we're kind of customizing SCPG SQL to, to add support for, for labeling of rows. This check row label takes two arguments. One of them is, is optional. The first argument is supposed to be the row security label. The subject context is going to be based on the client. So it's the SE Linux user combined with the network. And then Arg2, if it's there, is going to be a, a permission type. So it defaults to select, but you can specify that I want to check to see whether this user for this row can do insert, update, delete, and there's also relabel permissions as well. And then SC Linux is making the decision, returning this, the Boolean from this 
which is used in that using expression in the, in the um, policy for RLS. Uh, 